It is so good to see all of you here and those of you online. I, I see you. I see you in spirit. Now, you might be sitting in your pajamas or whatever. Don't worry. But I see your spirit, and it's so great. I'm so grateful to have all of you here. My topic today is I love Lent. I, you know, some people have a negative connotation with Lent. How many of you here just, you, you may still be a practicing Catholic or grew up Catholic or, or maybe Lutheran or Episcopal or one of those liturgical traditions that really hunkered down with Lent? How many? All right, I want to see my audience. Okay. So. Some people are like, eh, don't want to do Lent because, you know, at one time I was a leader in the Catholic Church. Now I'm still a Benedictine. I'm affiliated with the Benedictine Order in the Roman Catholic Church with Conception Abbey in northern Missouri. But I would assist the priest with Mass. I would lead a communion service in place of the priest. I would do all kinds of things. People would come and talk to me about their Lenten resolutions. You might wonder, what is a Lenten resolution? Now, first of all, Lent is like the 40 days, not including Sundays, which are supposed to be celebrations, but 40 days leading up to Easter. So, big party on Easter. But starting with Ash Wednesday, which was last Wednesday, and we had a beautiful Ash Wednesday service here, where we had a great time of prayer and meditation and distributed ashes. And I got to present a different aspect of Lent than many people have heard of. So, in the Catholic Church or some of the traditions, people would sometimes come up to me and say, oh, I'm giving up chocolate for Lent. I'd be like, well, why are you doing that? They'd say, because I love chocolate so much. Then why are you giving it up? Because I want God to see my sacrifice. And, you know, I was like, oh, okay. But inside, I'm thinking, really? Does God get off on that? Like, okay, you love chocolate. You're giving up chocolate for me. So that makes me feel really good. Now, as a father raising my son, if he really loves something, unless it was, you know, harmful to his life or someone else's life, I wouldn't expect him to give it up to somehow prove his love to me. That would be neurotic. <laughs> I'm glad you appreciate that. So... A lot of people have this image that Lent is about, oh, I'm not good enough, mi culpa, mi culpa, mi culpa. That is my fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. I mean, okay, let's get a different view of Lent here. For one thing, in unity, one of the acronyms for Lent, L-E-N-T, is let's eliminate negative thinking. Let's eliminate the stuff that's in the way of our spiritual progress. In Hebrews, in the Christian scriptures, Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews said, let's lay aside the thing that's entangling us, the thing that's weighing us down, the thing that's burdening us. So this is about a practice of letting go what's in my way. Now, some of you know that I was in Wichita, Kansas for about two and a half weeks with my mom. And mom, I love you. I bless you. I know you're watching. And while I was there, my mom turned 98 years old. <laughs> Yay, happy birthday. Lives independently at home. Very smart. She reminds Olga Lucia and I of things we need to do. She's very sharp. <laughs> now, I was there <laughs> for two weeks. Olga Lucia arrived. We were there together with Olga Lucia for about four days. Then I left, and Olga Lucia is staying there. You may have noticed she's not been here. She's staying there for the month of February. 
to be with my mom and catch up with friends and stuff. And so when my wife arrived, I picked her up at the airport. She only had one suitcase. Now, okay, you may not know this about my wife, okay? She only, I'm looking for the rest of the luggage. I said, are you still waiting on some luggage? Where's the rest of it? She said, I only brought one bag. Are you proud of me? I said, who are you and what have you done with my wife? What is the baggage you're carrying around? Are you just carrying loads and loads of baggage in your life? Maybe it's past trauma. Things that have gone wrong, it seemed like, in your life. Maybe it's past pain. Maybe there were times in your life, and I was reflecting on this, that there was a time in my life where I could no longer sense God at all. Yeah. It was a dark time. It was like a scary time in my life where I didn't feel connected with God or with anything. Can you relate to that? No? Great. But some of you are shaking your heads yes. Some of you know what it's like to, when, when you've experienced losses like at one point in my life, loss of marriage, loss of career, loss of friends, loss of my faith tradition, loss of my home. The worst of all was when it was affecting my faith. And it seemed like God wasn't there. Have you ever had trauma that pushed you deep? that pushed you so deep, you wondered, what is real? What can I rely on? What is it that my life is really about? Is there a God? Is there a divine presence that connects us all? Is there something more to life than just getting up in the morning, brushing my teeth, eating, going to work, coming home, watching a little TV, going to bed, getting up, Brushing my teeth, eating, working, watching a little TV, going to bed, getting, you get it? Is life more than that? I believe within our spirit, there is something that calls to us that is saying there is more. Are you open to the more? Let me ask you, are you open to the more? Yes. yes. And into that more I am speaking. Our spirit calls us. And just like that reading from Paramahansa Yogananda. That I'm here. I'm waiting. My altar is just for you God. I am here. Even if I wait for eternity. And that speaks to my heart. Lent is about letting go of the things that are in our way where we cannot feel and know and experience that full presence of the divine, that full presence of God, where we don't know and love and appreciate ourselves. Are there things in your life that you don't love and appreciate about yourself? When I was in college, I majored in religion. I also majored in speech. Part of being a speech major meant giving talks and watching yourself on video. And I would see people cringe when they would watch themselves on video. It's like, oh, you know? And some of those things that we see in others that most agitate us, that most trigger us, are actually mirrors about things about ourselves that we have difficulty loving. 
What is in the way of you fully loving and appreciating yourself? What is in the way of you fully experiencing the presence of God? What is in the way of you fully expressing as the presence of God? That's the stuff Lent is about releasing and letting go. We had a person who had been here years ago and one day this week, came and sat right here. He was just meditating in the chapel alone. We didn't know he had come in. Then we found him. And he told us that he used to come on Wednesday nights when we have our Wednesday, and we do this, 7 o'clock every Wednesday. We have a prayer and meditation service, and we have prayer stations set up. And one of those prayer stations is a burning bowl. And so over here... We have a burning bowl. So every week, people can write down the things they wish to release, and they put it to the flame, and they let it go. This man said, the burning bowl in just one event changed my entire life, where I was able to let go of the stuff that I was hanging on to. In one service, his life was transformed. And then he said, why don't the Baptists do that? <laughs> Baptists can do it too. I have nothing against Baptists. But there are ways that we can let go of some of those things that are in our way that Hebrews chapter 12 was talking about, to let go of those things that are tripping us up, that are weighing us down. I want to tell you a little story. When I was, okay, I've taken two pilgrimages to India. The first pilgrimage was with 54 unity and Centers for Spiritual Living leaders and ministers. And we traveled in India and went to Oneness University and we traveled to ashrams. And then a second time, I went by myself on pilgrimage. I told my wife, I'm going to India. I'm going by myself. I'm going for five weeks. And I'm going to places that where nobody knows me. And she said, what? <laughs> Say, what? And so I did that. I went to Delhi. was involved with the temple and ashram there. And then went to Vrindavan. Then I went to Indore. At, at a ashram and a school, and it's an Ananda Mai Ma ashram, and then to a jungle island in the Holy Narmada River, and this island is called Om Kureshwar. So I worked with youth, the poorest of the poor children. And when I was in Om Kureshwar, I met Swamiji. Now, Swami is an Indian teacher. Indian guru, and G is a term, J-I, G is a term of reverence, respect, so Swamiji. And Swamiji said, Mr. Tim, we must go down and bathe in the holy Narmada River. <laughs> right? I said, we do? We need to go down there? And what do we wear? You wear nothing, Mr. Tim. <laughs> nothing, Swamiji? Nothing. Well, can I wear something? <laughs> so, Swamiji said, I will give you something to wrap around yourself. But you must promise that you will keep this for the rest of your life. Never give it to anyone else. Never lose it. And so I have kept it. So this is the cloth that Swamiji gave me. So 
You can picture this, right? Well, maybe you don't want to. <laughs> so I had this wrapped around me, you know, and I went down to the Holy Narmada River. And the Narmada River is an area that is known for making Shiva lingams. Shiva, you've probably heard of Shiva. Maybe you have. These are rocks that are rolled on the bottom of the river and then they become objects of worship. They are representation of Shiva. And so I have a much bigger one upstairs about this big and it's heavy. So I brought the little one. So I went down to the Holy Narmada River with Swamiji. Now, Swamiji has this long beard and he's all dressed in orange robes and he takes me down to the Narmada River and, he's, and lightning starts flashing. Lightning is striking all around close to the river. I'm like, wow. And he's just laughing with glee and he's splashing the water. He's like, <laughs> Mr. Tim, we're in the Holy Narmada River. And I'm looking at the lightning. I'm like, wow, this is a trippy. <laughs> now, I went a second time. As I had heard, the Narmada River was a place where you could place all your trauma. Place all your hurts. Place those areas that you had not forgiven or that you hadn't let go of. That baggage that you had held on to. Trauma you had caused to others or trauma you had experienced. So I went down there and I prayed this really sincere prayer. Take all my trauma. Transmute all my trauma. All the trauma I have experienced, all the trauma I have caused to others, cleanse it, make me whole. Be careful what you pray. Now, for the next two and a half weeks, I got deathly sick. A growth formed inside my throat, almost completely cutting off my esophagus. So I couldn't. It was very painful to swallow. I could barely swallow. So I was just having liquid. I had a fever. It was a, over 100 degrees out. Humidity would reach 100% without raining. It was hot. And I could not get warm. I was shaking with chills. And I was sweating. I was sick. For two and a half weeks. Laying in this very primitive simple room in the ashram. With a little picture of Ananda Mai Ma. I experienced all the traumas of my life. And all the times I had traumatized others. And not only what did I witness it, I was there in it. Let me give you an example. So on one occasion, there's a teacher. And she's screaming at a little boy, me. She's angry and screaming in rage. I was able to enter that. Talk to the little boy, me, and say, you really are a good kid. You really are special. I know you don't feel like you fit in, but you have beautiful gifts, and you're going to touch many people's lives. I want you to believe in yourself. I want you to love yourself. And then I could talk with the teacher. And I said, I love you. I know you're frustrated with this little boy. 
I know he drives you crazy. But he is a special little boy. I want you to know I love you and I forgive you. I was able to go into every traumatic event of my life and bring about reconciliation. It would transform my life. Now, you don't have to travel to the Holy Narmada River and get deathly sick and meet Swamiji and swim naked in the river to do this. <laughs> Good news. You can do this right here in this life, right here in Honolulu or wherever you live, wherever you are. There are ways you can do this. You can participate in the burning bowl. You can go into meditation and release some of that unforgiveness, release some of that pain, release the trauma. You can release the extra baggage. It's easier to travel when you don't have so much baggage. You can let go and let God. You can really tune into that presence of God. Journaling can help. If any of you journal, that can help. Coming to our Wednesday night contemplative service. Those are great times of letting go. Practicing the quantum living process is a great way of releasing past trauma and embracing who we're really here to be. We are about transformational practices. We are here to transform. Now I know... We've been singing for some time that song, the Our Father, uh, the Lord's Prayer. And it's based on a literal translation of the Lord's Prayer as we have Jesus giving it. And it makes reference to the evil one. And some people have commented to me, ah, you talk about oneness and there's only one power and one presence. And then this song makes reference to the evil one. Now, I've gotten to the place in my life where, uh, you know, you can see that as those things that are tripping you up, those things that are holding you back, those things that are preventing you from being all that you're here to be, those things that are keeping you from having that direct experience with the divine, with God. Just know that we can do this. We can let go of those things. We don't have to hold on to them forever. One more story. When I was going through that dark time in my life where I was losing marriage and losing my home and had to change careers, by the way, when I got into hospital chaplaincy and was a hospital chaplain for 28 years, found that I loved it. I rented a place in very low income housing. At that time, I was a psychiatric chaplain. And yay, I got to live with the same clients that I would work with in psychiatry <laughs> because I was in low income housing. You know, one of them Knocked on my door one day. I open the door. She shows her wrist. Blood is running down. Can you take me to the hospital? Okay. You know, that, that was the neighborhood I was living in. I was helping to raise my son. Soon after I moved there, there was a, a, a flower bed. I mean, no flowers. But there was a, a space for a flower bed. So I was out there. Here's the new neighbor with a shovel digging a hole that's about six foot long and about three feet wide. <laughs> what would you think if your new neighbor was digging a grave right in front of their house? But I had gotten <laughs> about 40 bulbs and I planted these bulbs knowing that they would 
spring to new life knowing that around Easter time, they would come to life and they would shine beauty in that low-income area of depressed people. That my grief, my trauma, was actually an avenue to new life happening. If we allow it, our pain, our trauma, our challenges, those things about ourselves that we don't like can actually be avenues of new growth and transformation if we will embrace them and work with them. So I planted these bulbs. Having faith that I am planting the trauma, the loss, the grief, knowing that up from this will arise new life. Just as on Easter we talk about Jesus being raised to new life and that we also are lifted to new life. Those challenges, those traumas in our life are the very substance from which our lives can transform and grow. And it did in my life. I resolved that trauma and pain was too good of a thing to waste. I wanted to use it for growth and transformation. So in the spring, close to Easter time, up came all these beautiful flowers, symbolizing to me new life. That is what Lent is about. It's about learning to work with the stuff in our lives that is bugging us, learning to release it so that we can rise up to new life. That is what Easter is about. That is why I love Lent. Thank you for listening. I invite you to take a deep breath. As we center into the truth of this message, we know that whatever is going on in our lives, whatever trauma, whatever pain, whatever grief, whatever loss, we are whole, we are perfect. We place all of these things, the loss, the grief, the trauma, we place it in the fertile field, the fertile ground of the presence of spirit. knowing that new life will rise up out of this, knowing that we are not defeated. We are resurrected. We are resurrected to new life. We commit to this as we go into the silence. Spirit, we know that you are here living as us, surrounding us, walking with us. And we commit ourselves to being this light, to be this love, to let go of the burdens, to be this radiating presence of transformation as we bring heaven to earth. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. <laughs>